Hi everyone, today we're going to take a closer look at this ASUS ROG Strix X870E-E motherboard. Before I begin, I'd like to thank ASUS Singapore to have provided this board for me to share with you guys. These are all the accessories in the box. You'll be provided with a quick start guide where it shows you how to mount the M.2 and such followed by the ASUS web storage whereby it tells you that if you were to purchase 1TB you get 200GB free a leaflet of stickers where you have the crest and all these are the CMOS factory stickers and more stickers over here you'll be provided with two SATA cable which one of a right angle the other of a straight a bag of cable ties for you to do your cable management a ROG keychain the thermal pad for M.2 model 22110 is pretty short an additional M.2 clip just in case that if you were to break the clip that is mounted on the motherboard itself you can use this to change few bags of M.2 cushion rubbers which have a total of 5 these are the clip meant for your M.2 which are shortened so you can use this to clip to the uh, slot a very simple function antenna whereby this is magnetic and you can swivel but this time round when it's swivel right it used to be swivel all the way 180 but right now it stops only at 90 and I'll show you the function on how you use this antenna clips this is how the board looks like and I really have got to salute to ASU with all the detailing as in like the logo the patterns the labels I'll just briefly go through with you how it's been designed and such the attention to details is fantastic look at it for those who dare okay the uh, wording with the patterns and at this whole back casting in fact this is whole made of plastic whereby you have this for those who dare followed by details like Republic of Gamers and when is it founded as in like which year the ROG logo over here the strict logo over here with some patterns over here same goes to the bottom section where you see the ROG strict these are all the uh, M.2 heatsink by the way ROG strict Republic of Gamers with more patterns see all these arrow signs the strict logo okay and all these details my goodness it's full of details that's why I got to salute to ASU they have really go into this extent to label their motherboard for some you might like it for some you might not but for me I'm okay due to the fact that all this labeling right are very uniform they are not different colors things need to highlight like the streak see it's very prominent things like the uh, translucent area of the RG logo this is where the ARGB is the rest right are kind of like sitting behind the background and these are lifting up which is the RG logo which I mentioned the ARGB area and the street where else the rest right if you place it in the case right you will not see those uh, you know this wording and such except for the prominent one which is the street and the logo I mean the ARGB logo and of course this section over here to me it does you know it does strike out now another thing is that when I took this board out from the box it's very heavy reason being right there are lots of aluminum heatsink on this board starting off with the uh, top VRM heatsink see this is quite beefy and I like the way they design the fins as in like giving gaps so the heat dissipation off from the VRM right to this heatsink right it will dissipate fast same goes to the rear oh by the way the rear is only this bottom section which is 
aluminium. The top hole casting is plastic. Then followed by the uh, M.2 armor shield, or should I say the hissing, all this are aluminium. And this has a very special heat pipe, okay, which branch out to the top where you have this uh, RG streak, this is another piece of aluminium. Same goes with this. Okay, very tall. Okay, let me just take them out and to show you. See? It's very beefy. More than enough to cool down your Gen 5 M.2s. And for this, see? Okay, let me just unscrew and to show you. See, it's beefy. And as I mentioned to you, I see this is actually the uh, special heat pipe that branch out from the bottom to another piece of aluminium. Or should I say the whole block aluminium. So the cooling solution on the M.2s, right, you should not have a problem if you were to run a Gen 5 M.2. And also the bottom where you have all this also, to emphasize the cooling on the X870 E chipset, majority of the motherboard is either side by side, as they are too cheap. But for this, right, they have deliberately separated. So one is over here, the other one is over here. So having this to separate, right, even it generates heats when it activated all your lanes and such, it will dissipate fast. Where else, if you have both chipset together, right, the dissipation of heat might just accumulate and it takes a slower time to dissipate. So this is one thing good about it. And also another factor is that uh, one thing I like to pinpoint. Now, as you can see, when I lift up the board, take a look at the gap over here. See, based on the fact that these are very heavy. Okay, let me just remove all this. These are very heavy, that's why it warps. And I hope that ASU can actually improve on this, whereby they should include a back plate. So to strengthen the rigidity, and on the back plate itself, right, probably touch on the VRM areas so that it will dissipate the heat to the back plate too. There are more cooling to this uh, board itself. The measurement of this board from here to here is at 305 millimeter from here to here is 244 millimeter. For the thickness of the side VRM heatsink and the rear, starting from the side, this is at 35 millimeter. And the rear, this is at 45 millimeter. For the power phase of this motherboard, it's 18 plus two plus two. Have a amperage of 110. And at the center, this is the 1718 socket whereby it support AMD processor 7000 series, 8000 series, and 9000 series. At the bottom section, you have four DIMM slots that only cater for DDR5 RAMs, be it ECC or non-ECC, and has a max capacity of 192 gig. And it runs on dual channel, and for Expo profile, it's at 8400. Now, speaking about the Expo profile, do take note, if you are mounting a 7000 series or a 9000 series, processor, the max Expo profile will be 8000. Else, if you to plug a 8000 series, it will be at 8400. Kindly pay full attention of what I'm going to describe to you regarding about the PCIe slot, which is 2, and the 5 M.2 slots. If you are running a 7000 series or a 9000 series AMD processor, the top PCI slot will run Gen 5 at a catering speed, right? Catering speed of X16. And this is controlled by the processor. At the bottom, this is Gen 4 running at a speed of X4 and is controlled by the chipset. And as for the M.2, the first three slot, one, two, three, these are generation five, which is backward compatible and it's running off from the processor. At the bottom, it's at Gen 4, running off from the chipset. Now, 
earlier on I mentioned that this cater the lane as X16 Gen 5. This is the part which is very important. If you were to populate all the M.2s, yes, it will run at Gen 5 for the first three and Gen 4 at the bottom. But when you populate the second and third slot of the M.2 slot, this Gen 5 will not run at X16. It will run at X8. So take note on this. And another thing is that if you are running a 8000 series AMD processor, your first PCIe lane, or should I say slot, will no longer at X16 and will no longer be Generation 5. It will be at Generation 4 at X8. And the second and third M.2 slot will be disabled. As for the locking mechanism on the M.2 heatsink, starting from here, this is the first slot. All is needed. Okay, let me just zoom in and show you. All is needed is just to press this. This is toolless. And you can just pull it out. And to put it back, at the back where you see this, catch it at the back over here. And to plug it in. And as for the rest of the M.2, starting with the top. Okay, let me just zoom out. Starting from the top, you will need to unscrew four screws. And when you unscrew the four screws, right, please do it alternately as in like unscrew this a bit, unscrew this a bit, followed by the top and here. So do it alternately. Reason being, right, if you were to unscrew one of the screws off totally, right, you might just bend the rest of the uh, screws. So in order to prevent that, make sure you unscrew alternately. Then you can just leave it up and you expose the... Uh, second and third M.2 slot. And at the bottom, again, there are two screws. All right, unscrew them and take it out. And all the screws that is actually on the M.2 shield, these are all captive. Okay, so that you will not lose the screw. Same goes to this. I would say that the only toolless release mechanism right is actually on the first slot the rest you have to unscrew now and looking at the thermal pads the three top section which you have one two three both sides have thermal pads at the bottom at the top see else for the bottom section you only have two now for the locking mechanism for the M.2 itself. Okay, let me just zoom in again. For the first slot where you have this lever over here, see, you can push it to the back. So when you slot your M.2 in, okay, when you push it down, lift this lever to the back and to catch it, and this is in place. To release, you have to release over here. Now. For the rest of the four M.2 slot, which is one, two, three, four, their locking mechanism is the same, which I'll show you. For the four slots that I'm talking about, you have a clip like this. So in order for you to place the M.2, just slot it in, and to press this down, and you'll catch it in place. And to release, just simply press this down. Now, next thing I'd like to talk about is in fact the uh, PCIe slot. Where everyone knows that the top slot is meant for you to plug your graphic card. And how the mechanism works is pretty straightforward. As you can see this, right, the, there's retention on this clip. Maybe say when you slot in the card, this will hold in place. If you want to release, you don't have to press this at all. What you need to do, assuming this is the graphic card, pull from the back. So when you pull from, from the back, right, this will just go down and you can just lift up the card. 
This board is equipped with a ALC 4080 audio codec and to enhance the audio, ASU have plugged in their own chipset which is known as the Supreme FX and this is of high definition 7.1 channel surround sound. In order to trigger the 7.1 surround sound, make sure that you make use of this SPEIF out port. As for the connection, starting off from the left, this is the audio header which is meant for your front headphone and microphone jet, followed by a 4-pin PWM fan header, two adjustable 3-pin 5V ARGB connector, and this dip switch over here, as you can see, you can toggle to the center, to the front. This is meant for you to set a fixed generation on your M.2 or even your graphic card. Meaning to say, if you're running a Gen 5 M.2, leave this at it is. This is at auto selection. If you know that all your M.2s are running on Gen 4, you can switch it to the center which indicate that all the M.2s will be running on Gen 4. Same goes to your PCIe slot. And this will speed up the process of booting up. As in like, when you boot up, right, instead of the system set to auto where you have to verify, it doesn't verify at all. It knows that, okay, it's running on Gen 4, I can skip the verification. That's the meaning of setting it to Gen 4. Or if all your M.2s are on Gen 3, you can just switch to Gen 3. And when you're switching this switches over here, right, there are indication LEDs right above it so that you will not miss a thing. Next, another 4-pin PRM fan header. Total of 3 USB 2.0 socket. Very generous. Now, for this pin over here, I wouldn't have a clue what this is. It doesn't show on the instruction menu. I believe it's some kind of device to connect to here to check for error codes and such. Anyway, I'm just going to skip this. Next, additional two more 4-pin PWM fan connectors. Well, this is the CMOS factory. I don't have to say. Next, this is the front I.O. connector, whereby you connect your power switch, your reset switch, your power LED, and your hard disk LED. Next will be this pin over here. This is meant for your chassis intrusion whereby I don't think anybody will do, use this unless you're using an OEM case like from Dell, from HP and such. They have such a function where you open the case, right? It detects that the case is open. So this is meant for it. But anyway, we are not using this. Now at the top, where you can see this section over here, okay, this is covered. In fact, this is 3-pin. Let me just show you. See this 3-pin. This is meant for when you're doing overclocking and you need higher V core. By default, it will lock to a certain certain V core um, voltage. But if you require more V core, right, you can engage like switch from the back two to the front two. And this will release the full potential as in you can clock your V core until two volts and such. Not a problem. But this is only this is only meant for extreme overclockers whereby you are you know overclocking using uh, liquid nitrogen and such at all times it's just a normal user or gamer right? just leave it by default don't touch this pin at all and right in front you have four pin over here the top is known as the MR test whereby you connect to a device to detect you know errors and such which I don't know what device this is. Now, right at the bottom where you have this, this is your sensor probe. The last, I mean the uh, bottom two pin, whereby you purchase a sensor that has two pin, plug to here, and on the probe itself, you can just, you know, place the component that you want to read the uh, temperature. And this temperature will reflect on hardware info 64 or IDA 64. Now, coming to the front, you have a total of four SATA port. If you are to populate all the SATA port with SSD or 3.5 inch hard disk, you don't have to worry that you're going to compromise on the M.2s. In fact, you can use together with it. 
then you say you have a total of 5 m dot 2s plus 4 hard disks. Next will be a 3.2 socket whereby you connect your front type A port, USB port to this. Next, additional 3.2 socket where again, it provides up to two USB type A port. So imagine that your case right has total of four and total of two cables you can plug to here. You'll be able to have four USB type A port. Next will be the Type C port. This is two point sorry three point two at generation two point two, and it has a max transfer rate at twenty gig, followed by a twenty four pin socket whereby you pull power from your power supply to plug to here and to support the rest of the component on your motherboard, except for the processor. Next, you have the flex switch. I will guide you on the flex switch on the BIOS itself, whereby you can program this to turn off the uh, ARGB or to do this, or should I say program this as a reset switch. Next, a start button. Now, this is in fact power up. If you want to test your motherboard, outside the case and have all the components in right instead of placing the uh, power switch on the front IO you can make use of this switch so you just press on it and you just turn on next another 3 pin 5 volt ARGB connector a digital LED debug I mean the uh, interface whereby I should use the code and if you have errors booting up and such right the code will show over here and this is very useful where it's very detailed telling you that which part of the uh, motherboard is not functioning and right below right in fact there are four leds these are the general led debug leds now at the top you'll be provided with four four pin pwm fan header whereby you have cpu one CPU op and followed by the AIO connector or the pump connector followed by the uh, system fan. Now what does CPU one and CPU op means? CPU op in fact share the uh, configuration with CPU one. Meaning to say if you were to plug a push-pull configuration of a liquid AIO for example where you have one side three fans on CPU fan one the other side, another three fans to CPU op. When you configure in UEFI on the fan curve on CPU fan 1, CPU op will follow. In fact, it doesn't have a control, I mean the um, manual configuration on the uh, curve for CPU op. CPU op will just follow CPU 1. Then if you are using a liquid AIO, make sure that you plug the pump header to this pump connector followed by you have two reinforced 8 pin EPS connector which supplies the power to your processor now you might ask the question should I plug two EPS cable to here and to power the processor yes you can but I would say that you only need one if you are not an over, I mean it's an extreme overclocker, you just need to plug one, which is here. You don't have to plug two, because one is more than enough to cater a high-end processor. In fact, this one eight-pin connector, right, is supposed up to, you know, above three hundred twenty-five watt and above. So one is more than enough to cater for your processor, unless you're running on. Um, liquid nitrogen and do extreme overclocking right and you need more you know wattage to pump the v-core and such then plug two this is what i love to see tons of socket at the rear starting off with the hdmi this is version 2.1 making use of the integrated graphic on the processor and it enables to project out at 4k 60 hertz there are total of nine usb type a port and all these are version 3.2 generation 2 
and each port has the capability to have a transfer rate of 10 gig. Right at the bottom, there are a total of four Type-C ports, where the top two, this is USB 4, and it has a transfer rate of 40 gig. On top of which, you can make use of the external Type-C monitor to connect to here, whereby it projects to 4K 60Hz. By the way, these two are DisplayPort 2 at version 1.4a. And of course, this two port is making use of the integrated graphic on the processor. Next will be this two port over here. This is of Gen 2. This is of Gen 2 times 2. This port is able to transfer at 10 gig, and this port is able to transfer at 20 gig. On top of it, this is also a charging port that has a max load of 30 watt. Right at the top, this is a RJ45 socket enable to have the transfer rate of 5 gig. Now, coming back to these two buttons over here, one is clear CMOS and the other one is the BIOS flashback. And what does this BIOS flashback does? If you don't have a processor on your motherboard nor the RAMs, you can flash the BIOS. Assuming that uh, you know you want to flash to the latest BIOS, you just download the BIOS from the motherboard website, change the name of the file name, and to plug it to your thumb drive. Once you have the thumb drive, plug it over here, where you can see this white line over here. So when you plug this in, right, with the power connected to the 24 pin and the EPS cable, we can just press this button, the BIOS flashback button, hold on it 3 seconds, and you will just light up and just let go. Now, for the actual instruction on how to do the BIOS flashback without your processor and the RAMs, just with the power on, right? Please follow the uh, manual instruction online. Now, next, you have this Wi-Fi 7 socket, which is meant for you to connect your antenna which is provided. As I showed you earlier, right, this clip over here, these are pretty straightforward. In the past, you have to screw it, but right now, you don't have to. You just tuck it in, and it will be in place. See? Same goes to the bottom. So you just push it in, and you'll be plugged in. If you want to remove, just pull it out. And it does take a bit of strength to pull it out. See? Done. Next will be your audio, whereby at the bottom you have this SPDIF out, followed by the line out, which is meant for your 2.1 speakers, or should I say the version 2.1 speakers. And last but not least, the microphone in. Just a glimpse on the ARGB effect, and this is the only area where you have the ARGB effects, whereby you don't see it all over the shot, whereby in the past, there are tons of motherboard that you know, overdose with all the ARGB, making the board looks very messy. And for me, this board looks elegant based on the fact that the highlight is on the crest and the standout on the word streak and with this pattern. And also this whole block over here, which say ROG streak. So when you place this in the uh, case itself, these are the things that you will see. Kudos to ASU, as mentioned, the attention of details of where the logo and labels should be popping out. And all these subtle points, right, that you can see, the design on the M.2 and the VRM hissing, inclusive of the subtle, I mean, logos and such, which is on the background. So they have did it right with this. This is how the UEA5 page looks like at easy mode. But before I talk about anything, let me show you one thing, which is the flex key. I'll switch to advanced mode and under tools, as you can see here, there is this flex key. Right now it's set as reset. You can set to aura on and off. So when you save this profile, right, I will show you physically how it works. So when you toggle this switch, you will turn off the ARGB. As I show you, I programmed the flex key 
to have aura turned on and off and the flex key button is right below the start key. So if you have to press this once, you will physically turn off the RGB effect over here. Take a look. See, it's off. And if I want it on, I can press back again on the flex key button and it will be on. And you can also program this flex key to be reset besides turning on and off the uh, ARGB effect. Now there's one thing, probably a suggestion. I would very much like ASU to set this uh, flex button, right? Probably another button to the rear I.O. or to have a cable linked to the front panel I.O. whereby you can make use of the reset switch to press it and to turn off this. Reason being right, imagine that this is in the case and if you want to turn the uh, ARGB on and off, which you have programmed on the flex key, you got to remove the side panel and reach out to the inside of your case and to press this button. So it will be more convenient that if there is a not another button at the rear or to set a, you know, to connect this to the front IO where you have the front reset switch, right? Instead of using it as a reset, you can set it and plug it here to become an on-off switch for the aura effect. This is the UEFI interface that will be two sessions, starting off with the easy mode as what you can see here. Now, this is going to be very lengthy throughout the uh, introduction on the UEFI. If you want to skip this, you can. There is a timestamp. Just skip this and go to my end where I conclude and to review my thoughts about this motherboard. Now, back to where I was. This is the, in the easy mode whereby the top left section, it will show you the processor that you have plugged in which is a 9950X and followed by the memory which are the uh, dim slot that you populated and over at this side you can set XMP profile enable or disable followed by the fan profile now for fan profile there is only one fan profile that I have on this board reason being right is open bench and this is only the air cooler and at the cent center section over here at the top it will show you the uh, CPU temperature the uh, V-Core voltages and the motherboard temperature. And right over here where it says storage information, by right you should be populating your M.2s or your SSD. But for illustration purposes later, I just plug into USB thumb drive. At the bottom over here, this is the CPU fan curve and such. So you can make use of the uh, Q controller and to set your curves see or you can even set it manually i'm not going to go in that this you got to feed it yourself and these are the headers just for your information now over here you have this easy system tuning if you are lazy to you know set it manually as in uh, your pbo2 and your curve optimizer and your curve shaper you can just do a one click ai optimized now, for AI optimized, I will to advise you to read, okay, over at the top section here where it says o, uh, AI OC. Read all this and make sure you know what is actually going on before you enable the uh, AI, or should I say overclock AI, which is here. Now, at the bottom part where it says boot party, this is whereby I told you that the storage information, it should be your M.2 or your SSD, but as an illustration, I plug two USB over here. Assuming that you want to boot with Windows, you have dual OS, which is one um, M.2 is on Windows, the other on Linux, you can set the priority. So assuming this is Windows and at the bottom is Linux. If you want to boot by default Linux, all you need to do is just press this, hold on it and drag. So when this is upright, every time when you boot out the machine, it will be loading on Linux. If you want it on Windows, again, hold on this, pull it up. So this is what it's all about. At the bottom section over here, right, you have this Q-insert, um, setting the uh, UEFI to uh, default, as in like whatever you have configured, you want to set default, right? you can just click this or press F5. Now for Q-port, it will show you the interface of what is being plugged. See, I plug all this. One is my mouse, I mean, one is my mouse and keyboard. The other two is the USB drive. And with this say, right, all this you can click and configure. So when you click on, let's say memory, right? See, these are the things that you will be set. 
Now, the part is that for this Q connect, I do have a issue with it. Okay, let me just bring it back to the uh, configuration. Now, as I mentioned to you, right, the Q dash board, I hope that ASU will improve on this because reason being, right, you wanted to configure whatever you have selected here. Take, for example, I have to set the uh, memory. Okay, when you click on here, right, it does bring you to the page to set your memory. But when you press escape, it doesn't go back to the Q dash. So I hope something they can do about this. Where am I? Okay, I was talking about this. Now, next, save and exit as usual. Whatever you have configured, you can save and exit. Advanced mode, well, by later I'll explain to you more in-depth tuning where you can press either F7 or to click on here. At the top, you can set your time and date by clicking this. See, you can set over here. The languages, if you want to change the interface to read in Chinese and such, you can click over here. See, all these are in Chinese. Or other languages that you know or you recognize. Right now, I'm going to set it back to English. Now, AI over clock, which I show you, read all this before you enable it. Make sure you understand what is going on. Next for the search, take for example, now, I know there's a certain, certain function in the UEFI, but I wouldn't want to click here and there. So assuming that, for example, I want to set the uh, flex key, I'll just type flex and click on OK, see? It will take you straight to what you want to configure and you can conf configure the uh, settings that you have selected. Now, as for Aura, now this is different from flex key. This is a manual switch whereby if you want at all times to have stealth mode, when you save this and reboot the system, right, you will always on self mode. You will not be able to uh, turn on the ARGB or even the, uh, you know, I mean, even the uh, debug LEDs. So this is all up to you. You can set it, but at all times, I'll just leave it on. Resizable bar, this is meant for your NVIDIA card, whereby you set your, I mean, the uh, resizable bar. To on and off. Now heading to the advanced mode, either you press F7 or click on advanced mode. Again, I'm not going to go in depth on everything. Okay, when you're in advanced mode, right, you will most likely be prompt at the main area where again it shows you all the uh, processor, your motherboard BIOS, and such, and the RAMs and the languages you can set. And of course, you can set the time and date. Oh, time and date you have to set over here. So this is actually at the main. Now for AI ticket, I will only explain things that I feed with. First off, on AI overclock tuner, I will set the XMP profile. Okay. Or you can set manual up to you where you have to clock all this by yourself, which I'm not going to go in that. I'll just set it to Expo 1. Then these are the settings that you can set and such. Okay, not gonna go in depth. Just let you have a glance at what's going on. Then you can even set the uh, CPU core ratio per CCX, which is actually the CCD zero and the CCD one. Okay, by default it's four thousand three. I mean four thousand three hundred hertz, and you can set it five thousand gig and above. But all this is up to you. I'll just leave it at auto. Turbo game mode, you can set this enable to. So what it does is actually boost even further on your frequency to have higher um, gaming speed or FPS. GPU boost, you can do that too. This is only for integrated uh, graphic. If you're not using a discrete graphic card. DRAM timing control. Now, this is the part you have to pay attention. It allows you to do manual tweaks on your cache latency and such. But there's this section, especially for gamers. Scroll down all the way where you can see this. Uh, hang on, let's see. Where is it? This one. You clock 
DIFV mode. Where some of you are aware that there are two modes on RAMs itself, which is gear one or gear two, or game one and game two. So over here, right, majority of the gamers will select gear two or game two. Okay, this will enhance the uh, gaming experience as in like you gain more performance and gain more FPS, which is got to do with the clock speed of your RAMs. Okay, back to where I was. Pre precision boost overdrive. This is whereby you can overclock. Some of you know that, not say overclock, I mean, uh, yeah, overclock and underwood. The majority of them use this precision boost overdrive, right, to underwood. I would prefer to use this from the AI Twinkle, which I'll show you later at the advanced, right, you do have a AMD overclocking. So back to the AI Twitter where you have precision overdrive. I can set to econ mode, enhance mode, or to enable it. See for enhancement mode, right? You have all these settings that you can play with. And as in like, you don't want the uh, processor to go beyond 70 degrees, 80 degrees, or 90 degrees Celsius. Right, the rest I, we just leave it as it is. Do not play with this, in fact, the uh, scaler. Okay, my experience is that when you set to 10x, a lot of stress on your processor and in time, right, you will degrade even faster. So leave it as 1x, okay? Or even set it to auto, do not touch this at all. Next will be the curve optimizer. See, you can set all this up to you. Majority of you will just set negative and have this 30. And sometimes based on the uh, CPU silicon chip, if it's not a good bin, right, it will crash if you set to negative 30. In such event, right, pump it up, okay, maybe you say, from negative 30 to negative 20. So until you find the correct, I mean the uh, stable method for your processor to boot, right? Leave it as it is. Okay, right now I'm just gonna set, oops. Right now I'm just gonna set to auto. <coughs> Another function whereby you have the curve shaper. Now this, I will not explain much about it. It's a new enhanced tuning to underboard even more or should I say fine tune? Just to let, show you, see? This is the fine tune of each section. You have mid, low, medium, high, and max. So these are the enhanced, I mean the enhanced point where you can enable it and set it from point to point. As mentioned, I'm not going to mention, I mean, I'm not going to explain what how you do this clocking if you are interested, look out for Curve Shaper on YouTube and there will be more information for you to absorb. Now, another thing is that on GFX Curve Optimizer, some of you might play with it. This is for the in integrated graphic on your processor. But at all times, I'll just leave it as it is. I will not touch it. Now, other than that, let's go to the advanced mode. Things that I will play with, okay, and to take note. When you're installing Windows 11, by default, the X, I mean the AMD FTPM module right will be enabled. Just leave it. And the next thing I will configure is the PCI subsystem settings, where you will enable your resizable bar, okay? Just to do a double check to make sure that your graphic card is running I mean, your NVIDIA graphic card right, is running on the resizable bar. Then next will be this SATA configuration. If you have SATA plug, or should I say 2.5 inch SSD or 3.5 inch hard disk, right? Sometimes you just want to, when the system is turning on, you just want to unplug it while it's on. Please make sure to come to this SATA configuration where it shows you that all these SATA ports, right? You have this hot swap function. 
if it is disabled right do not just unplug your hard drive when your system is on make sure you enable this so when you enable this also another step you will need to eject from your lower right taskbar so that <coughs> so that you can safely remove the uh, hard drive which again as mentioned on the hot spot, make sure you enable it okay other than that for the APM configuration this is very useful for me normally power on by PCIe I will set this to enable reason being right my mobile has an app which make use of wake up on LAN so I can turn on my PC without touching the uh, power button just by pressing the uh, remote app I can turn on my machine which later on probably I will show you how I actually do it because most of the time when I do motherboard review right I tell my viewers that I keep this on so I will show you one day how you actually do it it's pretty straightforward then other than that onboard device configuration now for this right things that I do not need for example the um, audio I don't use the audio onboard I'm using an audio interface I'll just disable it or things like if you're not using the Wi-Fi you can disable it because most of the time I'm using um, the RJ45 or the CAT6 cable to my I mean to my PC just for internet connection so I'll just disable this now why do I actually do this is because if you were to disable this right when you boot up the system the system will not need to take time to verify are these devices connected or in use so you just bypass and go to the next one and to verify so this is what it meant when I disable it and it does help to improve on boot up time other than that all this stuff I guess you guys can have a look oh PCIe link speed now if you know all your devices right for example your graphic card and your M.2 let's say you know what are the generation take for example graphic card I know that right now you don't have gen 5 you only have gen 4 set it to gen I mean for my suggestion set it to gen 4 and the M.2s right make sure you know what is actually going on as in like if you know that it's running on gen 5 leave it auto if you know that all your M.2s are running on gen 4 I would advise to set to gen 4 all of it again if you do all this configuration right what it does is it will bypass verifying it and will improve on boot time okay this is actually the link speed this is done now coming to the oops advanced mode the rest okay early on I mentioned about the AI tweaker where you have the precision boost overdrive I will make use of this reason being right you have this profile over here when you set to enhancement else for the uh, advanced mode okay where you have this AMD overclocking when you click here right and to set the precision boost overdrive see it doesn't have the function for you not at all you got to do manual keying see it doesn't show you the temperature or what you want to it's just like a shortcut so I would use the AI tweaker precision drive pre precision boost overdrive now back to here for manual setting right for PBO2 some of you might know for the PB I mean PBO limits like the PVT TVC and EDC I will not use under advanced mode to do all this manual configuration reason being right these are all in millivolts so assuming that you want to set your PPT to a wattage of 192 take for example or maybe 200 okay you can't just leave it 200 in this interface you got to add three more zeros which is which is kind of troublesome so with this say right okay let me set this back to auto I would go to this AI tweaker set it under precision boost overdrive okay then oops this will be manual see the PVT TDC and EDC right I can straight away just set this it will be the voltage the amperage 
that you wanted. You don't have to set additional three zeros. These are all in what ampere. What's an ampere? Okay, again, this interface also have the curve optimizer and such, which you can play with. All right, back to advance now. Okay, good. Now for monitor, right? Temperature monitor, whereby it will show you what are the fans being connected and what are the temperature is like. See, it's just uh, your CPU, your motherboard, your VRM, and your RAMs and such. Next will be fan speed monitoring. When you click on here, right, it will show you the RPM of all the fans that you've connected on the motherboard pages. Where you can see fan one, I mean CPU fan, the uh, CPU optional fan speed and such. And also your liquid cooler pump. Now back one step. Next will be the voltage monitor where it shows you all the voltage voltage like your 12 volt, 5 volt and such. These are just showing the stats to show that you know your system is running on healthy with the uh, power supply that's providing all this uh, information. Next will be the Q fan configuration whereby you set your CPU fan as I mentioned to you. See right now it's actually PWM mode. You can set it DC if you have 3 pin um, connector instead of the 4 pin. Then you can set the profile as a like standard, silence, turbo or full. Or even can set manual up to you, whereby you detect off from the CPU temperature and to set the points that you wanted over here, which is based on the temperature and the percentage of the um, fan rotation. Take for example, let's say the temperature is at 100, right? You want it to be full cycle. Meaning you say your RPM will be go max. If it is at 70, I mean 70 degree, probably, you know, you set to another percentage, things like that. So these are the basic function. Okay, let me just set this to turbo. Now, <clears throat> this is only on a fan configuration. As I mentioned to you, right, on the motherboard itself, there is CPU fan and CPU op. The CPU op will follow this CPU fan. As you can see, there are no CPU op configuration over here. So take on that. Next will be the chassis fan, where all the system fan are located, or should I say the chassis headers are located on your motherboard. So if you do this right, oops, see, you have chassis fan 1, chassis fan 2, chassis fan 3, chassis fan 4, and such. And each of this right, you can set Again, just like your CPU fan, which I show you, you can set to PWM or DC and having the profile pro full turbo and such, or even set manual. So these are the general function. Now, if you want to choose not to, you know, control through this, right? As in like it's very troublesome to manually control. What I would advise you is that keep down to okay press i think it's f6 that's right you can use f6 to come to this interface the q fan control you can do by graph all right so this is how the fan configuration look like chassis intrusion which i told you we do not use this coming to the boot now csm is meant for legacy application or should i say devices we do not use this at all Secure boot. Okay, now for secure boot, this you will need to take note when you're play, playing Valorian. Okay, it will need you to set this secure mode to custom. Okay, so make sure that when you're playing Valorian, right, make sure you set this to custom. And having to say this, right, while you are playing and things like that, you want to reformat your M.2 or your hard drive. Please make sure before you do the reformat, come back to this interface, set it back to standard. If not, you're going to have a problem to, you know, you can format, but to place the OS, you will not boot. Then you're going to have a very big problem whereby you have to totally clean off the uh, partition and sectors. It's kind of troublesome. So make sure that 
if you are playing Valorian and you want to reformat your hard disk, make sure you come to this interface and set your secure boot to standard. Okay. Then next will be okay. Boot configuration. I don't have to talk much. These are all pretty standard. I don't really have to go through with it. Just to show you. And of course, you can choose whether when you come to UEFI like, to have easy mode or advanced mode. Okay, this is what it's all about. Next will be the boot sequence. As I mentioned to you, right, you can set. See? Okay, let me just can you see. You can set the boot, boot sequence. Be it the first one, as an illustration, I told you this is Windows OS. The second one is Linux. If you set to Linux, see, it will change. In the event when you re save this configuration and reboot, right, it will boot to Linux instead of Windows. Okay, other than that, come to tools. Now, these are all pretty straightforward. I don't really have to talk much about it. Except for the flex key, you can set, as I mentioned to you, I've set it to aura on and off. You can set it to reset. For direct key, I wouldn't know what this is for, so probably I would ignore it. Then next, oh, next on this right, I would check on the ASO drive driver hub. Now this is very important. Make sure that it's enabled. Reason for this right, the first time when you install Windows 11 on the system itself, when you boot up, it ASO will prompt you with a message asking you to update all the chipset drivers, all the uh, you know, LAN drivers, Bluetooth drivers and such. So it's all in one click. If not, you're going to trouble yourself right to go to ASO website or even to download the Armory Crate to manually install, download and install the drivers individually. So with this function, right, enable, right, you bypass all that. So when you boot up to Windows, fresh install Windows, you will just prompt, install all the drivers at one go. Okay, this is all about it. Next will be exit, the final one. Load optimize default, I think you know what it is. Whatever configuration you have done on UEFI at this current instant, you can just erase them off by just clicking this. Okay, it will not reboot. It will just erase off and bring back to default. Then you can start all over again to configure the uh, configuration that you needed. Save changes and reset. Assuming that you have saved everything, you can just reset. I mean, save the configuration and reset to the settings that you wanted. Discard changes means you did a lot of changes, but you think that you know you don't need it. You just discard and exit. Now, other than that, right? Okay, there's one section whereby you can save the profile. Uh, let's see. Okay, user ASO user profile. This is why I meant. Sorry, I missed out one step on the tools. So I mean, imagine that you have actually done all the configuration and you want to save the profile. You can come to this tool section. Okay, I'm talking about this tool section over here. Head down to ASO user profile. You can save the profile that you wanted see then if you have reset the uh, cmos let's say it crashes and can't boot you can reset the cmos or clear the cmos then come back to this page right and load the profile that you have saved my thoughts about this asu rog streak x870 e-e motherboard the aesthetic is fantastically good kudos to asu to have put in so much detail. In fact, the detailing is so fantastic, whereby places where you need to be settled at the background, it will be at the background. Places where you wants to pop, it will pop. Things like the crest, the badge over here, or should I say the logo, and this. It's so, how am I gonna describe this? It looks very premium as a gamer's bot. And on top of it, the cooling solution does provide very well on this board. Except of the VRM, which I will talk about it later, but that is only a minor flaw. Now, for the cooling solution, right, all the Generation 5 M.2s are very beefy, as in like the heat sink. And best part of all, they have thought about this, not having the chipset, the x 70 e chipset, to be located side by side. Because if you were to locate side by side, right, 
even with this big piece of armor shield or the uh, cooling heatsink, it will take time to travel, as in like the heat will absorb by this uh, heatsink and it will travel to the bank. Instead, wonderful job, they have split the chip, which is one at the front, one at the bank. So allowing the whole surface area to absorb at the same time and to dissipate more heat off from the motherboard. Well done. Now, as I mentioned that the VRM at the top, right, because when I run this system and to run Cinebench or in Windows itself, right, these are heating up. Imagine that this is only an open bench and I am at a room temperature of 30 to 31 degrees Celsius, as some of you have known. The temperature went up for this both VRM when I measure it is at 67 to 68 degrees Celsius, which is still okay but it's still on the hot side. Now, reason for this, right, I believe that there are room for improvement on this board based on the fact that this rear BRM heat sink, right, it's whole thing plastic, only the bottom section. So let me explain further. If you were to see at this angle over here, okay, Now, as mentioned to you, right, the top section over here. Okay, let me just do this. The uh, top section over here, this whole casting, right, is plastic. The only aluminum area is this, which is a very small area. So, it will be good if ASU can change the uh, cover, maybe litter on the uh, plastic cover, but having the whole block as in like flat with a plate of heat sink that will dissipate even more heat and that will help in the uh, cooling solution and also another thing as mentioned it will be good if they do have a back plate which have the uh, vrm touches the back plate that will even cool the uh, area of the vrm even further now that's the only thing that I feel should improve on, on the thermal, on the VRM. Something which bugged some of you when I mentioned about the lane speed of the top PCIe slot. When you are running off a 7000 or a 9000 series AMD processor, if you were to plug the graphic card here, it's supposed to run at X16. But if you were to populate the 2M.2, which is the second slot and third slot, this will run at X8. Now, I have done a Cinebench on this. To be honest with you, you can't really feel the big difference as in X16 to X8. The score is only about a few hundred, that's it. So, don't be so, you know, carry out that if this is going to run at X8 on your graphic card, right, it's going to lose out on performance, not at all. In fact, it's only a very minor flaw. The only thing that impact even more, if you populate this with a 8000 AMD processor, whereby if you plug this right, this will confirm run at X8 on your graphic card, and it will disable SOT2 and SOT3. Another good point is that this board, my goodness, tons of input. Okay, see? And all this USB type A port, right? Each has a transfer rate of 10 gig. There is no two port, version 2.0 or even Gen 1 kind of type A port, which makes this board, right, very versatile in a way that you don't have to think, I say like, okay, let me just grab here. You don't have to think whereby Oh, is this going to be transferred at 5 gig or is this going to be transferred at 10 gig? All, in fact, are 10 gig. You can just plug any one of them. So, this is a very good point. And also, another point, as I shown you, the fax key. I like this button a lot, whereby you can program it to turn off the ARGB effects. The only thing that I wish ASU have done, right? is to link up probably a trace, a copper trace to the uh, front I.O. whereby you may use of the 
reset switch of your case right to toggle the uh, ARGB or even to make another flex key button at the rear of the IO so that is even more convenient as compared to you have to remove off let's say this is in the case you have to remove off the side panel and to toggle the uh, switch over here so this is one minor thing now also coming to another point whereby the construction the locking mechanism is fantastic both on the graphic card and on the M.2 the only flaws that I find that probably all this hissing right the M.2 hissing at the bottom which is this and this have it toolless it will be pitch perfect also adding on when I mentioned that there should be a back plate because as you can see right when you hold the board right if you notice the gap from here to here see if I have to hold it up see it warps due to the fact that these are being heavy same to here see so a back plate will be nice all right with this say this is quite pleasing board I should say it does give me a mixed feeling in fact um, on the good side and on the bad side but overall I would say that this board is great and this is meant I should say for gamers and for light content creators all right with this I'd like to thank ASUS Singapore to have provided this board for me to share with you guys and if you are new to my channel welcome to my channel if you like my content do remember to subscribe and to click on the notification bell button till then take care goodbye see ya